Hi everyone and welcome back to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we're working on a 2020 BMW X5 hybrid and this car has been in a crash. And the crash was so bad that the left front wheel was totally sheared off. The axles were broken, uh, the, even some engine mounts were broken. They replaced the bumper, the grille. There is a big wiring loom in the left front wheel arch and apparently the wires had been snapped off, broken, shorted out. I don't know what, but apparently they repaired that and they cut the car at a point where it's drivable, but it still has got some electrical issues. Now, before they finish the bodywork, they want us to take a look at the electrical problems. So they gave us a to-do list. So let's see if we can diagnose and hopefully fix this together. Now, the first thing on our to-do list is a problem with the pedestrian protection system. When you start up the car, there is a message in the dash and in the infotainment display that there's something wrong with the pedestrian protection system. So let's go inside the car and let me show you that message. We're inside the car right now and I turned on the ignition. Now, as you can see, there is a message in the instrument cluster telling us there's something wrong with the pedestrian protection system as well as on the infotainment screen. Now it tells us there's a fault in the pedestrian protection system and we need to have the problem checked by the nearest service partner. Now I guess today you and I are the nearest service partner. Now before we continue, let me tell you a little bit more about the pedestrian protection system. When you get hit as a pedestrian by this car, you usually end up with your head on the hood. Now underneath that hood is an engine block and that engine block doesn't really cushion the impact and you usually end up with a little bit more than just a headache. Now the engineers came up with a smart solution. When the sensors in the front bumper of this car detect that a pedestrian is being hit within milliseconds, the hood of the car pops up a little bit, creating some room between the hood and the engine block, allowing the hood to absorb some of the energy. Now I'm not telling you that an impact is gonna be comfortable, but it's a lot more comfortable than smashing your head into an engine block. Now when the car detects an impact with a pedestrian, within milliseconds this explosive device in the hinge of the hood will go off and it will smash into the hinge, making the hood pop up. Now I'm pretty sure that when this car crashed, the pedestrian system was set off. Now the guys that brought the car to me probably know this because they already supplied the car with two used known good explosive devices. Now the problem is, this car has been in a crash, so there might be sensors damaged or there might still be wiring damaged. And when you install the new parts, they might immediately go off again. So before we install these, we need to make sure there are no other problems with the system. Now let's start out by checking the system for fault codes. Now, based upon the fault codes we find, we can create a plan and decide what to check next. Now the pedestrian protection system is a part of the airbag system. So let's select airbag and let's see what fault codes we've got stored. Now we've got two fault codes stored, pedestrian protection system, rear left, resistance to high, and pedestrian protection system, rear right, resistance to high. Now fortunately, we only have got two fault codes stored in the system. So no sensor fault codes, just those two fault codes for the rear left and the rear right. Now when they're talking about the rear left and the rear right, they are talking about these parts in the rear left and rear right of the hood. Now high resistance could still mean two things, or these parts went off and now have an open circuit, or because of the crash, we still have got a broken wire. Now let me show you a very simple way to check this. Now first we're going to disconnect the connector and then we're going to take a jumper wire and notice I'm using very thin needles, so I'm not spreading the terminals. And then we're going to short out the circuit. With the jumper wire installed on the right side of the hood, the fault code changed from the resistance being too high to the resistance being too low on the right side of the hood. On the left side, we still have got high resistance. Now that we know that the system can detect a short at the very end of the wiring, we know that the wiring up until this part is just fine and the problem is really within this part. Now since we've got no fault code stored for sensors, it's now safe to replace the part. 
Now shorting out an airbag system like I just did, or even taking measurements on an airbag system is a very unwise thing to do unless you know exactly what you're doing. Now notice I disconnected the actuator from the system so I could never accidentally set off the actuator. It's also not recommended to poke around on the sensor side of the airbag system because the sensors are the ones that trip the system. But measuring or shorting out the output side of the airbags with the airbags disconnected is a pretty safe thing to do. Now I did the exact same measurement at the other side and I had the exact same result, meaning there's nothing wrong with our wiring. Now I installed the new actuators or the used actuators. I didn't fully install them yet, but I just hooked up the connectors and I cleared the fault codes. And right now we no longer have got any fault codes stored. The message for the pedestrian system also no longer appears on the screen, so I guess the pedestrian system is fixed. So let's move on to the next complaint. Now, as you can see, no more messages for the pedestrian protection system, so let's move on to the next complaint. Now, since this car is a hybrid, at low speeds, it drives fully electric. Now, the next customer complaint is, as long as you drive electric, the climate control never starts blowing any hot air. Now the car is on and it has been for a while now and I have set the climate control at high but the temperature from the vents is just above 16 degrees Celsius which is about the same as the temperature in the shop right now. So that's customer complaint confirmed. When this car drives electric there's no heat generated by the internal combustion engine to heat up the cabin. So when it's driving electric, it uses an auxiliary heater that uses a heating element that's connected to the high voltage system to heat up the coolant and then heat the cabin. Now, since there's no heat in the cabin when the car is driving electric, somehow the auxiliary heater is not functioning or not functioning properly. So let's start out by scanning the climate control system for fault codes and go from there. I scanned the climate control system for fault codes and there are two fault codes stored. The first fault code being AC lint to no communication and the second fault code is electric auxiliary heater does not respond. Now I've got the car up on a lift because the auxiliary heater lifts underneath the car. Now over here we've got the gearbox and in front of the gearbox we've got the combustion engine and this is the starter motor. Now in between the gearbox and the combustion engine we've got an electric motor with the high voltage connection and next to the gearbox we've got the auxiliary heater. This is the auxiliary heater and on top of the auxiliary heater which we can't really see are two coolant lines and the auxiliary heater heats up the coolant. Now, I don't know if you guys can see that, but there is a little three wire connector right over there. And that three wire connector has a power, a ground and one communication wire. And the communication wire being the exact same wire we've got a fault code for because that communication wire is called LIN2. The auxiliary heater uses high voltage to heat up the coolant of the car, but the control side is all low voltage and it's only three wires. There's only a power, a ground and a LIN communication wire. Now, since we have got a fault code for the LIN communication, let's start out by checking that LIN wire. So I brought out the picoscope, so let's have a look. So I've got the scope connected to that middle wire, the white and brown wire, which is the communication wire, the LIN wire to that auxiliary heater. So let's see what's going on. <clears throat> and right now, we've got no communication at all, but the ignition is turned off right now. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna share this scope screen with you guys while I climb in the car and turn on the ignition. I just took a look at the captures we took and as you guys have already seen, there's nothing wrong with the lint communication. Now that doesn't mean that the auxiliary heater is talking back, but we know that communication is possible on that wire. 
Now, obviously there's something wrong with the communication, so either the auxiliary heater is broken or it's missing a power or ground. So in the next step, let's check the power and ground and take it from there. So this is the connector and we checked the communication on that brown and white wire and that was great. And now we need to check the ground on that brown wire and the power feed on that gray and red wire. So let's start out by checking the ground and gently back probe that brown wire and see if we have got a good ground. So we back probe the ground wire and we're gonna check that ground using a simple test light. Now, when we connect one side of the test light to battery positive and we touch that ground wire, the test light should light up. Now, right over here is our starter motor. So I'm gonna connect one side of the test light to the positive terminal of the starter motor and we're gonna touch that ground wire. And as you can see, the test light lights up. So there's nothing wrong with our ground. Now there's one more wire to check and that's this gray and red wire which is our power feed, so let's gently back probe it. And let's check it with our test light. So right now we back probe the positive wire to that module. And when we connect one side of the test light to battery negative and we touch that power feed, the test light should light up. So I'm gonna relocate my test light from the positive terminal of the, the uh, starter motor to engine block ground and when we touch a positive or a power feed like on the starter motor the test light is going to light up. So let's touch that power feed to the module and it looks like our test light doesn't light up so it looks like we're missing a power feed. By the way the ignition is on so we really should have a power feed on that wire right now and we don't, so we definitely have got a missing power. The owner of the car just sent me a picture of what the wiring of this car looked like after the crash, and that's the wiring in the left wheel arch, and that's exactly where the wiring for our auxiliary heater runs through. Now, right now, we can have two things going on. Either we still have got a broken wire and the wiring was never repaired correctly, or because of the crash, there was a short circuit and we have got a popped fuse. So let's start out with the basics and check the fuses first. So I quickly took a look at a wiring diagram and the fuse for the auxiliary heater is fuse number 110. And that's located in this fuse box underneath the left side of the desk. So you need to remove this panel and then you can pull down the fuse box and get access to fuse number 110, which is a five amp fuse. Now fuse number 110 is one out of these two 5 amp fuses. So let's check those. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. But on this side, we are missing a power feed. So it looks like this fuse is popped. So we got a popped 5 amp fuse. Now instead of installing a new fuse, what we're gonna do, just to be sure, is install a little amp meter into the fuse box and see how much current this circuit is drawn because what I'm concerned with is after a crash like this, the uh, short circuit could still be there. Now, if the short circuit is still there, we're gonna see a lot more than 5 amps, obviously. So we're gonna check that and if that's fine, we're gonna install a new fuse and see if our heater is back online. So let's install our amp meter into that fuse holder. There we go, and let's turn the amp meter on. And right now, I don't know if you guys can see that, it's about 0.1 of an amp. So let's turn the heater on, just to be sure. There we go. And we still got 0.1 of an amp. So that's fine. Let's install a new fuse and see if our heater is back online. Now I replace the fuse and let's confirm that the power feed actually makes it to the module. So I connected my test light to the engine block ground. So let's touch the power feed. And this time our test light does light up. So we're inside the car. I replaced the 5 amp fuse with a new one and I set the heater to its highest setting and I left it running for about five minutes now. Right now the temperature coming from the vent is 56.9 degrees which is 
nice and warm so our heater is definitely back online. Right now we've got two more messages in the screen. One is about the engine oil which has nothing to do with the crash but the customer wants to get that done at the dealership so they get their stamps from the dealership so we're not gonna do anything with this message but when we start up the car we get this little symbol over here of a steering wheel and in the screen we get a message increase steering effort so I quickly hooked up the scan tool again and I scanned the electronic power steering for fault codes and we've got a fault code stored and it says I don't know if you guys can see that, but it says EPS control unit, so that's electronic power steering control unit, initialization fault, steering angle, directional stability, not learned. Now I don't know if the steering rack on this car was replaced, but I am sure that after that crash they must have realigned it. Now this car has got a lot of features. I mean, it can park itself and it can drive backwards by itself. And to do that, the car needs to know exactly what is straight ahead. So every time you change something about the geometry of the wheels, you need to realign the steering rack with all the steering angle sensors. So I think they didn't do that, or at least we are gonna do that procedure and see if that solves our problem. So that's our message. Now I went into special functions and at the right top, you can see EPS steering startup. That's the one we need, and it's going to talk us through the procedure. Now I did the procedure and it was quite a lengthy procedure. I think it took about five minutes and it wants us to put the steering wheel at a 30 degree angle, then turn it all the way slowly to the left and all the way to the right. Then it turns off the ignition and on again. And it does this a few times, but after that, the steering wheel symbol went off, the message disappeared. And when we go into the electronic power steering right now, and read fault codes, we no longer have got any fault codes stored. So we took care of the pedestrian protection system. We've got heat back in the cabin. We took care of the message in the dash about the electronic power steering. Now there's one more message in that screen and that's about the engine oil, but the customer is gonna get that sorted at the dealership. Now I scanned the entire car for fault codes and there are two fault codes left in the entire car. One in the engine, and that's about the engine oil that, that needs to be changed. And the other one is in the CAS module and that's complaining about a low battery in the key fob. So I'm gonna change that battery and that should take care of that problem. So I think we did quite a decent job today. Now, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please subscribe to my channel. When you hit the little bell, you will get a notification each time I upload a new video. And always remember, diagnose then, fix it again. See you next time, guys. Hi everybody and welcome back to a new episode. <coughs> so, now when this car is driving electric, there's no heat generated by the internal combustion engine. So to get it, <coughs> and that's the wiring in the left wheel arch. Now that's exactly where the wiring for the exhaust, 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 in the left wheel arch, and that's exactly where the wiring for the exhaust, exhaust, exhaust. Oh. Now replace the, now replace, now I replaced the fuse and just to be sure